the people of sake actually brought me into sake. Back in 1988, this place was actually in Ginza on the main drag. At first it was kind of soy sauce, it was miso. To the point where it actually changed my life. New Year's Day 1989. Uh, not just sake as a beverage, but all the culture and history. And Good morning, afternoon, evening, or late night to all of our listeners in whatever time zone it is you may be di- drifting through. You are now tuned in to Sake on Air, the world's one and only podcast dedicated entirely to the world of sake and shochu, broadcast in general, bi-weekly from the Japan Sake and Shochu Information Center here in Tokyo, Japan. I'm Justin Potts, one of your regular sake navigators for the show, and I'm very excited to be able to share this week's episode. In recent weeks, we've had the opportunity to sit down with some really exciting guests for special events and interviews, and this week is no different. As a matter of fact, in a way, we're stepping up our game and branching out a little bit in two ways for a special two-part episode. For one, we're finally giving some much overdue and well-deserved attention to the world of shochu. We've dabbled in it a little bit up until now, and we have some great shochu-infused discussions that are lined up for the coming weeks, but this is the first shochu-centric discussion that we're really diving into. And what makes this one particularly exciting, however, is that we have a miniature who's who of the bartending, mixology, and cocktail world to sit down with us in order to share their discoveries surrounding Japan's little bit of distilled alchemy that is shochu. We are joined this week by, first, Mr. Thomas Waugh, bartender and director of bar operations at Major Food Group in New York. We also welcome Mr. Mike Enright, owner and bartender at Sydney's famous gin bar, The Barber Shop. We also have in the studio Mr. Ryan Chetniwardna. He's probably better known to everyone as Mr. Lion. He's the man responsible for White Lion in London, the cocktail bar that shook up the industry when it opened in 2013. And last but certainly not least, we are also joined by Matthew Hunter. He is the head bartender at the renowned 11 Madison Park, the restaurant ranked world's best in the world's 50 best restaurant awards back in 2017. A huge thanks is in order to these gentlemen who were kind enough to join us for a quick chat and a shochu tasting following what was a whirlwind week-long journey throughout Kyushu, Japan's southern island and motherland of shochu. And finally, to top things off this week, we also get into sake. And in order to do that, we travel all the way to France for the second segment. Or shall I say that France comes to us? Right after successfully wrapping up another Salon de Sake in Paris, Sake Samurai and organizer of France's largest celebration of all things sake, Mr. Sylvain Huet, popped in to chat with us during his recent visit to Japan. We catch up with Sylvan on what he's been up to, the evolution of Salon du Sake, and what he's excited about with regards to sake in Paris. So basically, we've got a very packed episode this week. It's at this point where I stop talking and we get on with things. So with that, on to this week's episode of Sake on Air. Before we get started, real quick, why don't you guys both say your names and what it is you're associated with. My name is Thomas Waugh. I currently live in New York City, and I work for Major Food Group, which is a large restaurant group in New York City. There's, we have 12 restaurants, and I am the, the uh, director of bar operations. So I curate the menus for cocktails and beer. Uh, not so much wine, but you know, spirits, spirits and beer. And cocktails is sort of my specialty. My name is Matthew Hunter. I am the head bartender at 11 Madison Park um, restaurant, so I just uh, focus behind the bar there. I've, I've worked for the company for close to five years now, and um, yeah, that's pretty much it. So I just kind of oversee the bar and my team and just help with, you know, the uh, beverage, the cocktail menu. Focus on that. Yeah. Excellent. How was your trip? Incredible. Great. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You said it was your first time to Japan. Anything mm-hmm. particularly leave an impression? or? Um, I think it's very nice for us to kind of see the, uh, the aspect of just something so uh, specialized as the Soshu production, to see the, the, the source of the material and then and taste it. So, you know, you, you see it, you taste it. It's, it's, it's really great. Yeah. For me, it was really, really special because I've opened to uh, Japanese, well, Japanese, 
style restaurants in New York and I've always sort of been flying by the seat of my pants. I've done my own research and and whatnot, but maybe I didn't know exactly what I was talking about when it comes to Sochu. So to be here and to finally like learn some really like hardcore like like real first ex- you know first hand experience material was just amazing. Meet the people as well. And meet the people. Yeah, the people are so passionate about what it, the culture of like uh, for us to go and drink Sochu like in a social setting is something very like we've never I've, I've never done it before so uh, to taste first just the balance of why it's so great with food and then the social culture of like why you know you've got a lower ABV product that you can drink like while you're eating food it's so it's it's meant to be consumed with food you know and so it's just nice to see that you know we're very much western culture so you know of course we sell spirits and drink wine and drink beer but for us to see just how versatile the the spirit is across the board it's really been eye opening for us and we're you know we're it's a it's a difficult category because we are uh, you know we're being from the united states we're used to either drinking beer which is very low ABV and crushable, or we're drinking like whiskey or something that's a high proof and very concentrated alcohol spirit. And so Sochu is like sits in the middle. So I think it's hard for a lot of people to really wrap their heads around what it, what it should taste like. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, they probably served it up to you in a number of different ways, different styles. There's no quote unquote one right or wrong way and so I mean, for the most part in the United States the way that people drink sochu when they the, the rare times that they actually do drink it <laughs> is is on ice but I found over this for, throughout this trip that drinking it warm is actually so much better you really get the flavor is is it it reaches that the flavor zone that you would get from drinking, like say, like a whiskey or something. So what is, how is shochu or, well, I don't know how much you guys got into awamori at all. You might have a few tastings this evening. Are those things that are in your tool set at all back home or? We're really trying to figure out uh, its place because we're, we're in this realm of uh, mixology, but we don't really know how it's going to fit into blending with different spirits, spirits that are higher proof. Um, because we we're afraid that we're going to lose a lot of these delicate uh, nuances of the spirit by putting something in. So and also like diluting it down with ice because that's the the nature of uh, building drinks. It's through dilution that you have your end product. So uh, it's already diluted though. Yeah, that's why I think it's hard to understand. Yeah, because there's two things about sochu that's hard to understand for Westerners. That there's no sugar in it. We're used to having a, a mouthfeel or body in a spirit or like or beer or sake it has sugar and we're used to tasting sugar and understanding like our our, our palates understand what sugar tastes like so there's not that and then it's already diluted so you take away sugar and then you add water to it now it's a really hard to understand our brains it's hard to understand what this is supposed to taste like because we're not used to tasting diluted no sugar spirit was it was there something in particular that kind of created a, a spark for you or a keyword or some something that you kind of latched onto that you're excited to take home with you? I mean, we love the uh, characteristics of umami, like these kind of like rich kind of like toasted, roasted notes of uh, barley and the difference between the distillation with black and white koji is very like we like these really kind of like nutty, fatty yeah. uh, aromas. Uh, and flavors yeah, because it's savory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We that's what we, the two of us, and basically the team. You know, we're really kind of uh, that's what ins- inspires us, or what we gravitate towards is like these kind of like richer flavors. So that's it was, what, which is it yeah. works so well with food, and everyone's like really pushing that the envelope on on it being. I, I'll, I'll give you an example. Earlier today, we were having lunch, and we were just playing a game. What if we had our own distillery, our own social distillery, and what would we do? And, and how would we approach the market? And we were like, well, wh- who are we going to compete with? Yeah. Are we competing with Japanese whiskey? No. Are we competing with uh, the wine industry? No. 
We're competing with beer because it's something that is so easy to drink casually while you're having a meal. And it's also something that tastes so good with food, mm. you know, so. So you're coming back with um, ideas to put on your menu already? Yeah, we, yeah, we kind of like, we, we discussed, you know, what we thought and um, we're really trying to more focus on expressing the spirit in its, in its uh, hundred percent like as it's meant to be enjoyed instead of like diluting it in the least bit so i mean thomas brought up an important point it was kind of like a, the style of service where it's like a social service where you're you know you have hot water you have cold water you have uh, ice it's really it's a, a spirit by itself it doesn't you know i feel like we don't want to kind of dilute it to a certain extent so that you kind of lose the nuances there's like so there's, many variables yeah. that go into making soju and it's so specific And even adding a, dr a couple drops of water completely changes it. So I was just thinking to myself, trying to mix with it is... We're going to lose it's it. It's going to be really hard. Yeah. yeah. So it's, I don't think it's a... I don't, I don't want to say uh, anything to take away, but I think mixing with it is going to be really difficult because it's already sort of... It's already been diluted. It's already been crafted to be something really specific I really think the best way for us to, to serve it is we have to figure out a way to make it special without messing with it too kind much preserve the yes. inherent nature of what's in there so like maybe it's like a table side service or yeah. something you know where you know you can you can bring over uh, snacks some snacks that would uh, like say like sweet potato chips or, I'm just throwing yep. ideas out there absolutely but you know So things that would really help you understand the flavor of it and support that flavor instead of say like throwing it into like a you know a lemonade or a whiskey sour sort of cocktail you know yeah, we want like, to keep it keep it real yeah make it more accessible mm -hmm. to the palate you know if you're introducing something that's like new to uh, the public who doesn't really understand Uh, the style or it doesn't really like if, if I'm going out to eat a Japanese cuisine and there's uh, and it's not just like sushi if there's a specific style that I'm going out for like how is that appropriate for what's what pairs nicely with what I'm eating you know that's the whole point of this is like we talk about how uh, soshu is totally meant and crafted to be consumed with your meal so it's like the focus is Uh, intently there to be it just tastes with better food. with food too yeah. yeah so will you try to pair it with the food you cook at home we, t we talked about this yesterday we, we did a we did a tasting uh, where we kind of like thought about uh, a line of uh, different soshu and how we would uh, pair it with different foods but I mean you know these umami flavors are very like especially what we found with the barley and even sweet potato is like we can pair it with a bunch of different foods because it's it lends itself due to the kind the of fatty or nutty what you eat at home yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. i mean yeah. i make macaroni and cheese at home yeah absolutely <laughs> i mean well, and that's i mean that's a really i mean that's a really good yeah. hint into i mean you i imagine you guys are actually doing that behind the bar as well too is what is this person going to like a good window into what they might like is what do they what does their diet like what are they eating on a regular basis I mean, we're, this is like really advanced talk. <laughs> right, right now, all we want to do is get people to start drinking it. I think, I think it's difficult for Americans because it's lower ABV, so it's already not like it's not a party drink. Mm. It's a more sophisticated drink. It's socializing. You, yeah. you and know. you and you and when you like for us, not, I'm not not saying that I'm not a partier. I, I would love to party, but you're. But it's not the party drink. It's like a little bit more sophisticated. You're going to sit and think about it. It's like it's a it's a quiet drink. But yeah. I think that uh, I think that you know for this particular thing, it's, it is a good socializing thing. And I think that like for people that are having dinner parties, it would be a nice kind of social introduction to certain something that you know Western culture like has dinner parties and people come over and they bring food and your hosts pour wine for your for your friends and they and they drink wine or they drink you know cocktails or whatever this is like definitely very easy it could easily be introduced in that kind of setting uh but you know again it's a 
we don't have any sort of knowledge about this. We don't know how it relates to, you know, something that's completely foreign to us and then uh, inserting it in what our Western day-to-day -day is. is like for people like, who, who Sochi, what's that, you know? Um, so... It's going to be tricky. Yeah, yeah, that's very tricky. We're just so, it, it's ingrained in us to... To just be like, drink a whiskey and yeah. a beer. It's, it's one or the other. There's not a lot of middle ground there. Yeah. And we have we've uh, we switched up. We have two new two new entrants into the Double into the match. <laughs> We're in. Why don't we before we get started? Why don't, why don't both you gentlemen s tell everybody your name and why why they should know you or where they could find you. Um, so, my name is Mikey M. Right? Um, I'm based in Sydney in Australia. Um, I own a couple of bars there, um, as well as various other projects uh, that I work on. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'm keeping very busy over there. <laughs> but it's great to be here. It's, uh, we've had an amazing tour. And to his right? Um, so I'm Ryan Chathy Wardner. Um, I go by a moniker of Mr. Lion because my surname's really long and difficult. Um, I'm a bartender based in London. I own a couple of cocktail bars out there. I have a little restaurant um, and I have some books and projects and various different products um, and essentially try and involve myself in every aspect of food and drink I can get myself involved in. Very nice. And so that aspect, I said you guys are here on a shochu tour, mm. um, but that aspect of food and drink, I think that's going to be something really important. What did you guys discover in the world of food and drink in relation to shochu? Were there any interesting discoveries this time around? Yeah, I mean, um, for me, it was more about um, getting to know the category. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it does seem like there is a ritual around that, and there's obviously, it pairs really well with food. Um, I think for the Australian market, you probably want to look at more of a high ABV for cocktail mixing. I think from my side, I think, um, you know, you kind of want it to be like almost like the base spirit of the drink to really get those characters through. Uh, however, I do feel that, you know, uh, the, the cultural difference would be tough um, <clears throat> to get people to just kind of almost have it as a sipping drink uh, throughout their meal. Yeah. What um, you say, Mr. Lane? Yeah, so from, I mean, I tend not to separate food and drink because, I mean, you, you eat, you end up drinking. If you drink, you end up eating. And, you know, a lot of the approach I think that all of us do as, as bartenders here is, is, is very similar to what happens in, in a kitchen. But I, you know, it's always really useful if you're trying to understand a product to be able to, to taste it in context and see how it relates to the culture around it. So being able to taste the foods, particularly going through different regions and seeing what the specialisms are, and it gives you a real window into the product. Um, so it's been a really, you know, it, of course it's important for us to understand it from the distiller's perspective, from the regional perspective, but it was more about really understanding it from a, from a cultural point of view um, and seeing it alongside the food, tasting it, being with all of the distillers and their, their approach to what they think it goes well with. Um, you know, that was really insightful and it helped us understand you know, why the flavor profiles are a particular way, why they approach the creation of the product in a particular way. Um, and I think that's given us you know, a, a huge amount more information than we had than we could do kind of just sitting alone in our bars and tasting it. Of course, we can analyze it from a um, flavor point of view and understand how particularly we might mix it, but it's so much richer to be able to come here, see it, experience it, and talk to the people behind it and then taste the food alongside it as well. Have you had experience shochu before? I tasted shochu, but again, only in an isolated way. So it was usually in a meal, but you were tasting one particular brand or product of shochu. So then being able to taste them in, in series. So not only were we able to, to go to somewhere like Iki Island, very specific, and taste uh, a regional style, um, but also to, to kind of taste across the different um, kind of bases of them. Um, and also the different distillers' approach to them, the different strengths, the different um, foods that they went alongside. So it's, it was very different. It was a huge enlightenment to be able to, to taste the spectrum of them and to taste them across the different regions. Yeah, I mean, um, same for me, really. It's kind of, um, we, uh, I did a cocktail, cocktail program for a pan-Southeast Southeast Asian bar uh, 
back in 2003 in Australia. And um, the cocktail menu comprised of, you know, sake and sochi. But we had no idea what we were doing. <laughs> Especially after this trip. Um, but, you know, we, we played with the flavours and that was the concept that we had and stuff. And, um, and it worked. Um, so this trip has been really insightful, like what Ryan said, in terms of, like, you kind of, you're getting so much more information about you know, A, the category, but also each distillery and, and each brand and, and what they're doing and how they're different as well. Um, it was really enlightening. Um, and, you know, it's it's kind of um, made me quite excited about the category um, that I didn't really know very much about. How often is it that you come across something that is so new? Is the, kind of the general consensus from everybody is that we realized how little we knew. Yeah. And that there was so much out there and that there was so much depth and so much diversity and all these things there. And that here is this word that was in our lexicon, but we really realized we had little to no knowledge or experience with this. Is this something you guys come across fairly regularly or is this? I, it, I, from, you know, you're absolutely right. We're very fortunate to be able to, to travel around the world and taste lots of different things. And of course, lots of places you go in the world, you're, you're tasting something unique because it is a reflection of a culture that's very different. But there is so much that is hyper-specific to shochu that we, I mean, I've certainly not encountered. Um, and, you know, it goes beyond the idea of it just being a cultural reflection. There is a, a different approach, a different methodology, a different set of ingredients here. Um, so it was, you know, this is this is very unique. And I think that's that's the, the thing that we've really opened our eyes to is not only the fact that these are an amazing product, but nobody in the world knows about this. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of crazy because as professionals, you try and expose yourself to a wide range of things, um, but it just really shows that there has been such a difficulty in, in kind of getting under the skin of this category. You know, the, the transparency isn't there, and it's very difficult. You know, of course, there is a language barrier, and there is a, a difference in being able to um, really get to that information, but it's, you know, for something so unique, it's kind of shocking for us to, to kind of really see something that's kind of in its own category um, and we've not really been exposed to. Yeah, so especially Japan's kind of in the spotlight, you know, culinary wise and everything. And so hot uh, right so now. Many, right, yeah. right, <laughs> right. There's, people are going out of their way to come here and, yeah. you know, find things and look for things. And the shochu, it's been around for quite a while and it's readily accessible. <laughs> Absolutely. And I, and I think it's, you know, we've, we've taken some of the, the, the lessons um, that are, are happening in the rest of the, the, the booze world at the moment, you know, there's a big push for the idea of transparency, more information, and that's reflective of what the consumer is after as well. But they're also after new experiences, new flavors, and this is something that kind of could offer both. You know, it's something really different, um, and it's just, I suppose it's a bit of now our duty, <laughs> having experienced that, to kind of take that information out there. But it's, it'll be exciting to see how those um, kind of barriers around it break down and people can start to, a wider group of people can start to discover this as well. Sorry. Yeah, it, no, I completely agree. I think um, we, you know, I, I work a lot in the gin category back in Australia um, and travel to a lot of gin distilleries and whiskey distilleries. And um, to come across, you know, uh, to experience what we've just experienced was pretty incredible. Um, and it will be interesting to see what happens with the category, you know, globally, to see whether it can... Um, you know, start to shine and, and basically have some awareness around it, really, because nobody really seems to know really quite what it is. Um, I spoke to Ryan and there's a bar in London that opened a very long time ago, maybe 15 years ago, called uh, Social Lounge, which was underneath Roku, which is a brilliant restaurant, um, I think in Soho, mm -hmm. yeah. And um, they had a social bar and that was the first time I'd heard about the category way back then um, but you know we don't really know what they were doing with you know with Soshu then and, and to the complexity of what it is I think it was more around infusions and um, basic cocktails I think um, but you know it was you know way ahead of its time and it'd be great to see the category um, you know expanding and, and get some awareness but like main education and stuff it is quite hard because it is, you know, we, we've just had a kind of almost like a brain dump over the last week uh, from all the distillers. Um, but, you know, yeah, it's kind of, you know, how we can translate that on. Um, 
to the customer but also obviously our teams and bartenders and, and explain how, how it's made and, and why it's so different and, and the cultural side too. Was it was there anything in particular that kind of a light kind of clicked on or something some a keyword or a key anything that you were like, ooh, there might there might be something here. I feel like or you were talking about like that transparency when it comes to communicating back home. Was there anything that you felt like this is the type of thing that I can that I think people can latch onto, or this is the type of thing that I can. I, I think the real difficulty is there is several of those. It's not like yeah. there is one um, key distinction. There is there is lots. You know, of course, there is the pre-sacrification with Koji. That is that's very unique. Um, but I, I I think it goes beyond that. You know, it's that's actually an easy way in. I think because you know what you were saying before about particularly from a culinary perspective, there's a lot of. Um, focus on the Japanese techniques with, with around food and the use of koji. So that will help. It's an anchor. It's something that people can go, okay, I've, I've heard that word and I understand a bit about that. But then it's just peeling off layers of the onion of it. So there's so much more to kind of delve into. And then there's such a wide spread of different styles that um, it's, it unfortunately isn't as simple as just being going, oh, this is the bit of information. This is the nugget that will help get it past the line. I think it's, you know, it needs to be a much more kind of... Um, you know, concerted, like kind of rounder effort to try and be able to, to, to kind of bring that to the public. What about food pairing um, in your world in London? Um, as, as I said before, we try and do a bit of stuff where we blur the boundaries a bit. So, you know, I think we, we always try and do it where it's not necessarily trying to sync the two up because I think that can be quite difficult. And what we try and do is co-create the dish and the drink and the experience and how that sits at a particular time in the meal um, but I think there are so many unique textures flavors um, and particularly the ABV is helpful in, in, in a kind of food setting but there are so many opportunities for us you know that, that's you know we have a very small space that allows us to have that experience for people um, but I think there is a, a, a huge amount that could be done because it it offers this you know, there is this savory aspect to the profile of it that I think will give a lot of uh, opportunity. But I think being able to create a few simple serves around particular styles that will help people think about when they can enjoy it. Because I think it works great with the cuisine here, but you want to show that it can work across a variety of different cuisines. Um, and I think being able to anchor it at a particular point in the meal. So this works with savory like you know um you know grilled style dishes or something like that something a little bit easier and a bit more universal um along with and then you serve it either over ice or, or with this tea or something like that something that's very simple will help people be able to then contextualize it so they can then start to add in their own um kind of modifications to suit their palate and stuff yeah i, um, I mean in sydney um in australia in general is um it does have a huge Asian population, um, so the cuisines, you know, pan across, you know, the, all across Asia. So I think, you know, I think you've got to try and take it from um, traditional Japanese to like more contemporary Japanese sort of style in terms of the cuisine. I think um, that that to me would work. Um, and I, I just think, you know, I think, you know, it would be quite tough to get people to go to Soshu as opposed to drinking sake with their food. Uh, so a lot of education would have to be done around that. And there's a lot of work, I think, to be done. Um, but I do think from the cocktail food matching kind of thing, um, you know, which is relatively popular over there, is, you know, there's definitely something there where you could entry them in there. Like, hey, don't just drink this neat or over ice, but hey, it's in this drink, and that, I think that would create quite a bit of awareness um, to, I think, the consumer and the guests in Australia. Um, yeah, I think that would be the angle that I would take personally to sort of like get that, get it out there about the category and what it is. Last thing, what, what could we do to make your guys' life easier? So here in Japan, whether it's the brewers, whether it's the people on the education side, where it's the people who have connections, what could we do to make your life, to help with that transparency or to help get you the types of things you're looking for? I, I mean, sorry, because to, 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 there was something that we, we were discussing when we were tasting this, and I think, you know, a lot of the time the information stems from the very traditional aspect of it. So it is a barley shochu aged for this amount of time from this region. Um, and that's great and it is important and it helps uh, explain to people that there is a, a you know that there is that regionality 
but every distiller does something different. So we need to know why does this taste the way it does? What can we do to to kind of um, kind of um, source it for the the guests to be able to contextualize those flavors? And being able to know that they use this particular koji, they do it for this period of time, this is what is specific to them, and this is why these flavors are there in, in this particular barley or rice or sweet potato ko- uh, shochu. Um, and so I think that resource where the, the, the educators are working alongside the, the distillers to, to kind of give a real kind of uh, insight to what they're doing, that will, that will help hugely. And so there you have it. That puts our special shochu interview session. Uh, that brings it to a close. Sebastian, thank you again so much. I mean, it's been really interesting to um, listen to these people on the front line of uh, cocktails and mixology. And um, I mean, great experience for us as well. It was. It was really insightful. I said, I think what the we were just talking a moment ago, sort of what the producers are hoping for from their shochu and how they'd like to see it enjoyed. Sometimes, right, what the producer is envisioning here isn't always how it translates uh, overseas and how people pick up on it and how people use it. And in an interesting and exciting way, I feel like maybe the what the producers anticipated, right, bringing over mixologists, they're looking at, obviously, how do we factor these things into into these different cocktails and whatnot. Um, but maybe that isn't the end game or the solution that um, we're going for. There, there was a major focus on food. Um, a lot of the things that the producers and a lot of the local people tout as being the really amazing parts of shochu and what really makes it special, what was really neat to hear was that that's what a lot of the people got out of the experience. That's what they really discovered and what they really want to bring back and find a way to introduce. Yeah, and they want to introduce shochu as it is um, and not as a component in something else. Right, without having to doctor it up too much into, you know, t- um, stripping a- without stripping away all of, the, uh, all of the nuance and everything that makes it uh, special and exciting. So it will be exciting to see what all of these tal- talented gentlemen come up with. Next up, we have Mr. Sylvan Yuet, sake samurai and organizer of Salon de Sake in Paris. He's joining us for just a brief chat during his recent visit to Japan. Enjoy! Sylvan, welcome to the show. Hello, Justin. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. I said we're really happy to have you. I said we're, we're having a lot of fun here, and so we're really excited to have you here. You've been having a lot of fun lately. Maybe too much fun. <laughs> no, there's not such thing as too much fun and too much uh, sake talks and sake events or things. So on the body, sometimes it can be a little hard, <laughs> especially the traveling part. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, well, um, for the past five years, uh, actually, I've been organizing uh, what is uh, probably today the largest sake event outside of Japan. It's called Salon du Sake. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, a sake fair uh, that is open to general public and professionals. And uh, uh, this year, we had like more, almost 5,000 visitors over three days of fair. Uh, we had almost 500 different types of sake to uh, for the visitors to taste uh, we had 65 or 66 percent of professional visitors lots of new visitors from 42 different countries and we're doing uh, of course we have all the exhibitors seven prefectures participated uh, by themselves or uh, with the Shuzo Kumiyai and we had like 74 exhibitors so yeah it's it's every year it's growing growing it's getting even more international it is uh, the European fair for sake and Japanese uh, uh, products main uh, is, is of course about Japanese sake, but we also have uh, some uh, beer or some Japan wine and some Japan whiskey is very trendy uh, yeah. also brought. Absolutely. So very good. I said, I want to hear a lot more about Salon de Sake. Before we jump into that, for our listeners, so Sylvain Hewitt is, uh, as you probably gathered, the producer, organizer, and master of ceremonies for everything Salon de Sake, as well as just about the entire world of sake in and around France these days. Um, if the word sake and the word France come up together, generally your name is attached in some way, shape, or form. So how should how should our listeners know you? What is what is keeping you busy these days? Well, first of all, I'm such a big fan of sake. I discovered <laughs> sake the first time, Japanese sake the first time I came to Japan about 20 years ago. Felt in love with the with the beverage, and uh, it started just as a shumi, as a, a leisure. I wanted to learn more. I wanted to have my friend learn more. Actually, at that time, I was uh, I was a practitioner of aikido, which is a Japanese Japanese martial yeah, art that like coming nice. to Japan and most of my Aikido friends and I, I was a professional dancer at that time uh, as well most of my uh, uh, friends they were 
they knew wine very well. I didn't come from a sommelier wine background, but they teach me about wine, and I wanted to teach, teach them about, about sake. So, so far, it started as uh, just uh, learning by myself and having my friends sharing it. And from uh, a group of friends to their friends to their friends of their friends, it became all over France and now all over Europe for the past uh, 15, 10 to 15 years that I've been doing that professionally. A lot of people probably uh, associate you with, as you're mentioning, Salon de Sake. So this is an event that has been going now for five, six years? Actually, uh, yes. Yeah. So we started that in 2013 okay. uh, in, in Paris for the first time and then uh, the, the following year we, we t- took a year off to find a new location and uh, since 2014 uh, we've been doing that every year uh, and now it's always like uh, beginning of October uh, September is very full with uh, wine and other beverage events in, in France and of course October most brewers are starting to brew yeah. uh, so we're trying to have it the very beginning of the month and uh, yeah it's been growing uh, from the first time uh, I wanted that event to be a uh, a European scale event because I knew that even though the French market recently has increased a lot uh, and quite fast, uh, but I know that the French market or any European market is quite small and it takes a lot from the brewers to come to from Japan to France or Europe for the first time. So from the first event, uh, it was a European scale event. Uh, but now it's getting even more international. This year we had, that, as I mentioned, I think visitors from 42 different countries. That's that's excellent that your original intent was to make something that was of European scale, that wasn't just specifically necessarily for the French market, but having that on an international scale. What have you been sort of keeping in mind each each year as you adapt it and change it as the market grows and as things change? Yeah, well, there, there were like two main goals for me for Salon du Sake, and that was from the beginning and still is. Uh, f- first, uh, maybe not everybody knows that, but in France, but all over Europe, it's the same. Uh, the word sake is associated with uh, Baidu, with with a spirit uh, offered at the end of the meal, even in most uh, cheap uh, sushi place, which are um, usually not Japanese owned, but maybe owned by Chinese or uh, Korean people, which uh, they offer at the end of the meal something that they call sake, please have sake, to thank their customers. So they don't charge for that. Uh, but it, usually it's not Japanese sake. Uh, so one of the most difficult thing to have people try sake in France, but it's not only in France, it's all over Europe, is to have them understand that it is not the drink that they think. Most people say, oh, I've had sake, it's too strong, thank you, no, no worry, I don't want it. Uh, but once they start drinking real Japanese sake, it's a, they enter a new world. So basically changing this image of uh, the word sake and having people understand that Japanese sake or Nihonshu is the real thing that they have to discover uh, has been uh, one of the main goals of Salon du Sake. Uh, putting together such a great large event that even the press, the journalists, not only the, speci- the drink specialist journalists, but uh, also the general media, uh, since the first event uh, up, up until now, they've been talking more and more about sake. The other uh, idea that the goal is to uh, open the market for the brewers. Um, I don't import sake myself, uh, which uh, over the years has allowed me to have good relationship with all the major actors, all the major importers. And since I don't compete with them, it's easy for me to have them uh, vis- uh, participate in Salon du Sake. It's important to have that neutral figure in there. Every yes, now I'm <laughs> trying so far that, that because I love sake from all over Japan. And the part of uh, Salon du Sake is introducing of all the sake that you can already find in France or in Europe, but also many uh, new sake that want to uh, to reach uh, Europe, and uh, and for that uh, we've been doing many different things. First, uh, the increase of uh, profile visitors uh, is very important, and recently uh, we've had that many um, you know the wine shop dealers uh, in France are very important. Uh, in French people buy wine at the wine fair or the department stores. First, they go visit the the local wine shop dealers for advices, for tasting, and I'm pretty sure that once the wine shop dealers in France uh, get a grab and and sake and can start promoting sake, the market will evolve uh, even more quickly th- than it is. Uh, but also we had lots of buyers from uh, uh, restaurants, from uh, department stores, from uh, all kind of uh, uh, business that deal with, uh, with with sake and this is very important. But the one thing that uh, we have been evolving the most is Salon to Sake is a tasting event. So we have, uh, this year we had 74, 75 uh, from the just one table, one brewer introducing his own sake 
to large uh, Hyogo prefecture, what the guests of Fener, for example, the issues um, v very much larger, or Saga prefecture or Miya prefecture came with a lot of uh, brewers to, um, to uh, introduce their sake. But also we do lots of uh, events, like lectures, uh, can be about the general culture, can be about specific topics, like what is Kimoto, or what is Yamahe sake. This year we focus on Kan sake, hot sake, uh, because French people, they don't know much about hot sake. Uh, of course, they like sake that is close to what they know, which is wine, like fruity, uh, the type of sake you, you drink in a wine glass. But uh, since I don't want sake and wine to compete, I want them to be very complementary. Always try to promote and explain how sake can be different from wine. And one of the ways to play with sake uh, in a way that you cannot with wine is to play with temperatures. And I think for the chefs or the sommelier, uh, being able to offer a drink at the same temperature of a cold plate or even colder or a little warmer or a hot plate with the same temperature or warmer or colder is something that is amazing uh, that brings so much uh, flavors, new flavors into the food. Uh, have the gets the umami being discovered in a way that uh, cannot really with wine. It's uh, something that we want to explain to people. But once again, French people think of hot wine, which usually is not good wine. You want to drink that only to get warmer in the cold season. And we add uh, uh, ginger and sugar. So that has a very bad image. And Kanzake, even people from my staff who haven't been to Japan yet, they don't get what is hot sake. So we do try to focus a lot. We have lots of panel discussions about sake being made out of style of Japan or uh, how the uh, sakayasan, like the wine shop dealers or uh, the restaurants can get sake and can introduce sake uh, to their customers. And also one of the most trendy part of Salon du Sake consists of what we call pairing workshops. Uh, for one hour, we try to pick a, a uh, and this year we had like very different things. One was uh, sake and oyster. So we had some chef, Japanese chef or French chef, making a recipe out of uh, one sake that I gave to them in order to pair it with oysters or just try different type of oyster with different sake. Also French bistronomy is uh, uh, very rediscovering itself. And uh, recently we had like the very traditional, simple bistro food that uh, has become trendy again. And uh, we tried to pair that kind of food with, uh, uh, with Japanese sake. And it was wonderful. All the chefs uh, work in a way that was at the same time very traditional, bringing the traditional taste of those traditional recipes, but uh, in a very modern way uh, associating with sake. I said and that, that business focus that you're talking about, that's that's really interesting. I think that's going to be a really important side is, you know, is there, you, it's an amazing opportunity for the casual consumer to come and try a lot of different sake. As you were mentioning, there are people in different areas of the market that have a large role to play in helping communicate and educate and an ongoing theme that seems to keep coming up on on this show is the need to also re-educate is that there has been yes, a lot of exactly. education and experience There's that has happened levels, yeah. and so we actually have to get back break down some of the preconceptions and, and build those back up again whether it be with how sake is typically served as you said at the end of the meal or what is warm sake how does that you know uh what is the potential in something like that having to sort of change people's perceptions um who do you think has an interesting role to kind of play in bringing sake and introducing those new um, opportunities and experiences? You're talking about, you know, wine merchants and, and sellers and things like that. Yeah, the, the one thing that uh, once again is connected to the fact that the word sake you use uh, for something that is not Japanese sake uh, makes that, um, I mean, in America, uh, the sushi boom uh, uh, all over the world as well um, brought together as a kind of a sake boom. Uh, in France, in Europe, that's the opposite. The sushi boom uh, made a bad um, image for what is people know as a sake. Uh, so that for that reason, uh, most of the Japanese restaurants, of course, are introducing sake the best as they can do. Uh, but so far, the uh, Western food restaurants, the French food or the fusion restaurants or, or the wine sommelier may have been the people to promote sake the best way to introduce it to those, uh, to those customers. Uh, and in terms of that, uh, the wine market is a very mature one, uh, the recent market as well, even though it's always like new new restaurant opening. And for example, in Paris, we have lots of young, um, fabulous Japanese chefs who are 
uh, getting a uh, Michelin star to their restaurants and they don't cook any Japanese food. They make French food. And uh, one of them, uh, we, give, uh, we give them a carte blanche uh, for a specific workshop at Salon du Sake. And that was amazing because even though he's uh, making French food, of course, his sensibility uh, comes from various experiences that he has both in Japan and in, in Europe. And uh, he's also using some of the Japanese ingredients. But in terms of uh, introducing sake, I think every single layer of the business should do their part. We talked about the sake asan, the uh, one shop dealers uh, that should be able to introduce and explain what is sake uh, to their own customers. Being the salespeople of distributors, uh, being able to explain to the sommelier, to the chef, uh, to the uh, grocery stores, not only what is sake, what sake they have and ca how can they introduce those products to their own customers. Uh, uh, being also uh, the sommelier in the restaurants or the chefs. And there's a huge lack of education. I mostly do education uh, besides organizing uh, events and not only like large events such as Salon Sike but much smaller scale event like private events or general events uh, uh, but education is something that uh, I think uh, will make a difference and that's why 20 years ago when I started educating people about sake I never really consider importing myself or selling myself I thought in order to develop the market first uh, education should be the first brick to uh, build, uh, build that world so now nowadays Many people are doing education, even the distributors or the salespeople are doing their kind of education. And when the brewers come to such uh, an event, they do educate the consumers as well. Uh, but I strongly believe in uh, independent education uh, so that people can make their own choice. I don't think that we should drink uh, sake the way Japanese people drink it. I don't think we should drink it the way American people drinking or other European countries, Northern Europe. And we do have our own cultural trends but also everyone is independent so for me everyone should make sake their own not only in the one they pair it with food for the professionals uh, but how they drink it at home do they drink it in a wine glass or do they prefer or choco do they drinking cold do, do they like like uh, very light uh, and uh, fruity sake or do they prefer more full body sake and for that there is not one answers and i think part of the way to enlarge the market is to have as many people try as many sake as they as they can and make their own choices of 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 of, of sake and that's uh, what i've been doing and what salon du sake is a great tool to do educating not only the general public but the professions as well excellent you mentioned that idea of education a lot of things i think these different markets these international markets they're going to grow very organically i think over time as to you know how does sake fit into this world, whether it be in France, whether it be in Italy, whether it be in the U.S., it's something that, you know, through the work of all the people that you're talking about, mm. was probably something that will ideally grow very organically and become something that is, you know, unique in in each of those yes. territories. Of course, like um, brewers and. Uh, uh, organizations as, such as JSS or JETRO or some others have some goals to introduce sake um, towards the world and, and, and to different markets, European, France, uh, Europe, uh, France and others, uh, uh, European countries as well. Uh, but there's uh, some kind of natural growth that can come from people being interested in sake itself or into Japanese drinks. Uh, I think I mentioned that uh, Japanese whiskey, for example, is uh, uh, very trendy and like for the, the one shop dealers, they often have customers not coming from Japanese sake but coming from Japanese whiskey and then they can start explaining to them but we also have other Japanese products have you ever tried Japanese sake to which they say yes I have no thanks and then we, we have to explain that no that's not what you think please try it uh, but also like the uh, organic wine um, market also is trying to get uh, some different type of sake uh, in, into the market also the uh, Japanese restaurants are trying to get more and more sake, but as I mentioned, either the very expensive, uh, trendy two or three mission star restaurants, the uh, the palace hotels uh, yes. also have sake at the bars or on, on the menu. But as I mentioned before, even the the simpler bistro type are starting to have sake pairing. Uh, so through 
many different ways. And I think at Salon Sake, if we look at the visitors that we have, we find all those kind of people. Some have been traveling to Japan uh, and they want to get back in touch with what they discovered uh, during their trip. So they want to uh, meet the people and, and taste Japanese sake. Some others are more, uh, don't, they don't really care about Japanese sake itself. They're more interested to the new trends for like many journalists uh, coming to Salon de Sake. Uh, so far, they may or may not have not experienced what is rich Japanese sake, but they just want to try new tests, new trends, and then talk about those. So there are many different levels, many different ways. And uh, as, as I mentioned, for the general public, uh, they should make sake their own. I think all different aspects of the market uh, should make sake their own. O of course, some ways are better than some others. I think that when people try to explain that if they like one, they will like sake. It's true, but very often to counterfeit the uh, bad image uh, of the bad use of the word sake for spirits, they say sake is like wine. You like wine and you like sake. Uh, but sometimes it uh, builds sake to getting into some competition with wine, which I think is it's not the best way because what well, French people they love their wines yeah. and they drink <laughs> mostly French wine. So if if we put sake in competition with wine, we know who will win. It's, it's kind of going always going to be a footnote on the bottom yes, of exactly. the. Exactly. So um, I often explain people, if people are looking to sake only what they like into wines, basically they want to drink wine. So they will find the kind of sake that looks is very close to wine, fruity, uh, uh, they might like uh, acidity or uh, they might think sake is a little too sweet for them, but they, they, they will find those kinds. But sake is not only that. We have sake that has almost no, f no aromas, that is very good, the, the type that you can drink uh, room temperature or hot. Uh, some sake is more full body. Uh, and so uh, having people understanding that sake can be close to one, but also can be very different is also a very important part of getting into all the layers of the consumers and the professional markets. So that's, a, that's a really big challenge and I think a really important one. And that the idea of the wine world has tons of lots and lots of amazing people and amazing organizations doing lots of work and can lend so much support and advice and there's so many opportunities to grow sake through wine but as you say at the end of the day sake or nihonshu has to stand on its own as its own entity in yes. order for it to really really grow do you think we're getting there is because i think that that's something that's been a challenge for a while and that at first you just have to get people to try it right you need yes, to, you exactly. need to first get that headway and but at some point the table needs to turn and we have to go from look at something it's something you don't know just give it a try to actually it is something that has this huge that is just full of depth and possibility and is something really special that can truly stand on its own and are do you feel like are we getting there where well, is france it's, it's there already the the, the thing is um how many people yeah. yeah, that's because many people like I'm not the only one comes to Japan. They discover your Japanese sake and they have their own experience. I don't have any, I don't pretend to know it all or that my choice of sake are better than some others. Like uh, I've been involved in the, some sake contests for the first time, which was very interesting. Uh, but, you know, putting grades on sake and saying this is the best one. Or it's very odd to me because one sake that is good for me might not be your favorite. And uh, you might find this one much better and or depending on, on the type of food you're pairing. But in terms of um, having people discovering sake by itself, um, it's there and not there. Uh, as I mentioned, the first step we have to find, and I've been dealing that with more than 15 years, every time I try a, a, start a seminar or a lecture, I have to explain not what is sake, but what sake is not. I have to start explaining that it's not a spirit. It's not a, a digestive that you eat at the end of, 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 of the meal. It's not f uh, 40 or 50 degrees alcohol. It's not a distilled spirit, a distilled uh, drink. So in order to get that, I understand that people are trying to explain that it's very close to wine. Uh, but then again, the wine people, the semi people, their amazing knowledge of wine helps a lot with uh, introducing sake. But sometimes it's not enough uh, because they only interpret uh, sake through their knowledge of wine and I don't come from a wine background I have never studied wine and I'm lucky enough to study with uh, the best family they, they introduce uh, the great wines to me and introduce the uh, sake to them uh, but there are many uh, other ways so if we look at five years before now or ten years the market has changed a lot uh, as I mentioned the uh, wine shop dealers that were waiting for oh, 
the month I will have like 10 customers asking me for Japanese sake, I will consider uh, bringing it into my shop. Now, most of them, they're either considering, studying, or thinking, uh, should I try having sake, those, those kind of things. And in the past, they may have tried, but because of the market was not there yet, uh, it may have been difficult, so they decided they decide not to move on with it. But things are changing, because people are demanding to try uh, new products, they are demanding to uh, uh, try Japanese sake when they know what it is. And some people also are trying to discover sake that is very different from wine that they drink on, on every day. Some others, they just want to find the same pleasure with sake that with wine, and it's perfectly fine. Most of sake are being sold, um, uh, being trendy outside of Japan, even in Japan for the past 40 years, or like Ginjo type of sake that is very fruity and uh, very um, approachable, very, uh, very easy to get with. And uh, so, as I said, again, there is not one way, uh, very different type of customers, very different uh, networks uh, to do sales, to do uh, distribution. And uh, the, that's why at Salon Sake or through education courses or through other events, we're trying first to get people to try it by itself. And then some people want geeky explanation. They want to know how it is made and they want to know all about the uh, Tokutai Mei Soshu or the Ginjo the, uh, Diner. Some other people, they may just want, who's making that? How long have they been making it? Oh, really, they're in the campaign and, and, and it's, oh, that's the first women making sake in that rich. Those kind of stories uh, touch people sometimes even more than the uh, technical explanation. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, world made of many different types of people, many different types of uh, restaurant or distrib distributors, and we should find different sakes and different ways to explain sake for all of them. Right, it's very, the market is very multi-layered and diverse, and as is yes. sake, which, which, is, which, I which think, makes it very interesting. Which is what makes it fun. And right? uh, yeah. I don't want sake to be just a new trend, and then they, they will switch to the, new, to the new drinks after that. So rather going too quickly, strongly step by step uh, moving on to uh, the next one is what is happening and I'm very happy about it. So I think that's what kind of what makes wine that makes craft beer and whiskey and these other things really interesting and exciting as well is the fact that you get it you can grasp enough to know that you can't know everything hmm. and that's kind of what makes it fun and appealing I feel like is that you can you taste and you try and you experience enough to realize I'm never going to know all about this. And that kind of yes. propels people to want to learn more. And I think people are starting to realize that sake has all of those elements and maybe more yeah. <laughs> in some way, in some ways. And, and again, so. they come from a point of view where for them, there's only one sake, like the, yeah. uh, the one that uh, it usually they're drinking. Uh, there's a, a, a picture of a, a nude person uh, in, 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 in the choco that yeah. the, that's what the thing. So starting from there and thinking it's not, Oh, it's not a uh, spirit. It's not a distilled drink. It's, there's oh, more than one, there's 10, 20, and we had 500 different at Salon du Sake, but no, there are way more in Japan to be discovered. Uh, it takes a lot of time for people to discover that, and then they got lost. I said, oh my God, I cannot eat all. So some people, that might be scary. So that's why bringing, like doing pairing workshops or doing thematic discoveries or doing like we had a great event at a at a movie uh, festival, and it was like Japanese movie, and some people were came from the mangas, and some from well, the more traditional movies. Uh, those people they might not get interested into sake at the first place, but drinking a little bit by little and discovering makes them not a, an intellectual drink, but a pleasurable drink, something that they drink only because they enjoy it, and when they want to start learning about it, they they might find many different ways to do it. Lastly, I said we sort of touched on the idea of education, and you talked about all the different um, professional workshops and things you did with Salon de Sake this year. Was there any particular educational event or experience or something that you felt really stood out that either resonated with uh, the professionals that you were working with or with those that were, or the casual consumers that were there experiencing it? Was there anything that really was like, wow, this is really eye-opening? And then just right now while you were in Japan was there anything that really stood out to you that was really exciting or is there anything back in France that has you really excited at the moment well, uh, one of the theme for pairings was uh, oyster and, 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 and sake and uh, as you may or may not know like uh, uh, French people when they eat fish uh, they eat cooked and Japanese people they eat cooked fish but mostly uh, like sushi or sashimi they eat raw but for oysters that's the opposite uh, most french people they eat uh, 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 nama, namagaki uh, like raw oyster yeah. and in japan oysters they can have nama but uh, raw they 
when they say it's so, when it's raw, usually it's more like cooked or uh, that, that way. And uh, we had that pairing uh, theme uh, with oyster. Why? Because in France, it's a lot of oysters. People love it. And even people who don't like oysters started to like it when it was paired with sake. So not only um, doing that kind of educational experience makes people understand that oh sake is good but also it transforms the way they can uh, have food and uh, as i mentioned uh, again some people myself including when i was a kid i didn't like oysters it's only when i came to japan that i started eating oyster and uh, pairing it with sake uh, makes it even better uh, to me and uh, we had a chance to work with one of the best oyster farm from uh, uh, from Bretagne where uh, my father was born, so I'm half French Britain, mm -hmm. uh, which made me uh, v very proud. But uh, yes, those kind of very simple. Also, one thing that we do very often is pairing cheese with sake. And wine and cheese is very important for French people. Uh, but having them understand that sake works very well with cheese also opens a new uh, a, a new realm of possibility uh, for them in terms of you don't even have to cook you can just buy some cheese and have a, a bottle of sake with friends at home and uh, for the wine shop dealers they can explain that to the customers they can do it at the shop itself and with the order it's the same so it's very easy because most people think so oh, now I, I like sake but i don't cook japanese and then i cannot bring it back home that's the opposite people should understand that there are many ways to do it. and and the other part of your question was in japan well i was lucky enough to uh, be hired uh, by a belgium company that's studying that has been doing uh, wine and beer and uh, a spirit con contest for more than 25 years uh, but this year they wanted to get involved with sake and uh, they had a part a great partner with the media prefecture and uh, they started uh, what is called sake selection uh, it's a new international contest we had 35 judges from uh, 19 different countries. I was hired as the international sake expert uh, because of course that Belgium company has uh, little knowledge of, of, of sake but also I had to do the uh, testing sheets and half of the judges were, came from uh, uh, media, wine and other worlds and half of the others were like more like sake specialists. That's, so having to work with different type of people in order to uh, help them understanding um, and finding their own way to taste sake and uh, in, in, a, in a contest and then bring that back to their own country and talk about sake in a new way that was very very interesting not only meeting the people but also testing we had more than 600 uh, sake for that uh, first contest uh, that was uh, very in terms of human experience having many different kind of people uh, little like salon sake but salon sake people come to enjoy themselves to learn by themselves here there was a group of people that has a unique goal together that was finding with it a selection of sake the one that would have maybe not the best sake i don't think a, a competition should be about finding which is the best one but it was like finding the one that might have the best chances uh, overseas and that's the way um, i made the testing sheets and that's the way we organized the contest to select some sake out of a huge uh, selection uh, to help them uh, finding the new market. And it's, it's all about very important because, you know, sake consumption has been declining in Japan and every year some great brewers might end making sake and we really want to help all those people to find a way to sell sake in order to keep making uh, to keep uh, um, protecting that traditional art uh, of making sake and uh, competition are part of that and I'm, I'm happy that there are new international or local country by country competitions that can help the brewers to find new markets that's wonderful i would love to hear more about how you Put that together and how that worked <laughs> that out. That was also that, quite a challenge. I can year. imagine it's in that tasting sheet, and, it's, and I think that's important: is right setting different types of standards and different ways of evaluating uh, not just the value but the potential for yes. sake. And I think that sounds like a great opportunity. Sylvan, I know you have to run. I know you I'm have some place so to be. So sorry for that. I'm, I, we can probably meet some other time, and I'll be very happy to be here. Right. Oh, you're, you're most welcome to uh, come to Salon de Sake Nature's to and that. to do a live show or that something. I would love it. And, and for, it for uh, uh, people listening to that show, uh, if I may announce that Please Salon de Sake already, uh, we decided the dates. Next year is going to be October 5, 6, and 7th. It's Saturday, Sunday, and Monday event. And you're most welcome. Uh, you can find out Salon du Sake, Salon. Uh, 
Salon, uh, minus, uh, do minus Saki. Dot. You just Google it. Salon, <laughs> and you'll, you'll, there's you'll only one. There's, there's only one that, that, that scales. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for coming me. on. And uh, we will have you back on again once you're, once you're on the island. We'll dig into more of these. Yes, and please. it's set. Uh, Saki on air next year, live at Salon de Saki. Yes, <laughs> good luck with uh, Saki on air. Thank Perfect. you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs> it's great having you in the studio. Thanks so much. Thanks. And with that, we wrap up another episode of Sake on Air. I hope that you enjoyed what you heard this time around. If you did or didn't and would like to share your thoughts, please feel free to mail us at questions at sakeonair.com. We would love your feedback, questions, and show ideas. You can also message us and track our adventures on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at at Sake on Air. If you have a moment, a kind review on the Apple or Google Podcast Store or whatever service it is you're listening to this on would be greatly appreciated as well. A big thanks is in order to the Japan Sake and Shochu Makers Association for helping to make this show possible, as well as to Export Japan and our man behind the boards, Mr. Frank Walter, for all of the great production support. We will be back again in two weeks with another episode of Sake on Air, broadcast from the Japan Sake and Shochu Information Center in Tokyo. Until then, kanpai!